Howdy, everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful day, night, evening, morning, wherever you may be, whenever you may be watching this. Um, I just wanted to come here today and talk to you about UTF-8 and multi-byte encoding and what all that means, especially in puzzle solving. We'll do a little bit of performance just to see what it looks like. But this came out of some comments from the previous leak code videos we did um, where I was collecting the values. There's, um, we can fix that obviously, but I thought maybe we could go a little bit more in depth into why we use cars versus bytes and stuff and, and maybe when to use cars and bytes. I, I, I probably use cars more than I should bytes, uh, um, or strike that, reverse it. Um, anyway, so that's the video for today. But again, just, uh, thank you everyone for all your comments and stuff. Um, Please uh, keep them coming. I, uh, I'm i keeping track of all the things you talk about. Um, I do want to mention, too, before we get too far into it, um, a couple resources. Some people um, had been asking questions about Rust or how to get into Rust. Um, Google actually produced this paper. Like Obviously, you can read the Rust book and some things like that. But Google produced this little Rust book that is meant to be used for uh, teaching a course. And if you're interested, I can actually go through some of these in the videos and do some of the stuff with you. I'd be happy to do that for Rust. If you're interested in it, just let me know. You can see it's got speaker notes and stuff like that. But it's meant to be very rudimentary and teaching you, you know, from the ground up to becoming Rust proficient. So anyway, I'll include the link here. This is just something for you to look at. I've had people ask me about Rust and, and how to get into it. There's also this uh, little book of Rust books that has a lot of good links too, right? So I thought I would just share that. Here's, um, you know, different, uh, I think this is the Rust, uh, the Rust programming language. This is the book I was talking about. It's like a lot of people read this the first time. But you're welcome to go look at these if you're looking for something specific. There's like uh, also in this link or, or in this little book of Rust books, there are some application books that will give you like an idea of, oh, I'm interested in game development, for example. And it will show you some uh, some books that have been written or things that have been written about it to help you get to help you get started. So uh, sometimes I like to look at these curated lists. They give me ideas of things to study next or things that I'm interested in. Um, so feel free to look there if you're interested in more Rust. And if you'd like me to do like more Rust stuff, uh, not just puzzles, but Rust stuff, let me know. I'm happy to do that as well. Um, Rust is kind of my passion project thing that I do when I'm not working. Um, so we, we don't use Rust at work, although I'm always trying to sneak it in. But I will have a link to all these things uh, for you to look at if you're interested in it and want, want to be using it. So with that, let's talk about multi-byte encoding in UTF-8. And I actually want to start here. I have these switched around. If you have been around for long enough or not, I mean, ASCII is still pretty commonly talked about. Um, the When initially... People started saying, hey, we want to have computers and we want to represent characters. They kind of looked at their keyboard, right? Here's my keyboard. I guess it's upside down for you. And they and they were all American or English speaking. At least most of them were. And uh, so they created a character system that was based off of that, right? So you can see here's the characters. Here's their byte value, their decimal byte value, and actually it's, you, um, you'll you probably see it in hex more often, but here's their actual byte values. And um, what, what does that mean when I say that, right? When you type a B in the, in your screen, on your screen or whatever it pops up, when you save that to disk or something like that, or if it's being stored in memory and you're processing it, it's actually a series of bytes, right? It's not an actual B in there. It's a series of byte bits. And um, in in what they did is they said, okay, whenever we whenever we see a B for a string character for a character, we're going to represent it as the number ninety eight. 
and uh, that allows you to do interesting stuff, right? Remember, the computer is just ones and zeros, a bunch of ones and zeros flying around all over the place. It's doing it at extremely fast speed, but it's still just ones and zeros. So they, so what they said is, look, if we do, if we create the number ninety-eight with those ones and zeros in binary, I want that to represent a B, right? And they kind of stuck with that. And um, the, the original C um, and Q Basic was one of my first languages. They all assumed ASCII was being used, at least from what I remember, right? And you always just had these characters right here to, to deal with, right? So you had lowercase, uppercase, some special characters, and some of these things over here just like... Um, special terminal codes or codes that are meant to be like, for example, the end of a line, right? The carriage return type thing right here when you press the enter button, right? Um, they're meant to represent those. But again, they're all just numbers it to the computer. And then j when it, the computer wants to display it, then it's the job of, you know, the system to figure out, oh, that 98, that should be displayed as a B on my computer terminal or whatever, right? Um, and I, I won't go into the details of how all that works because quite frankly, it's been decades since I've done it, but um, that's the general idea, right? The problem is, is not everyone uses these characters. And I think I mentioned it in my post. My The first language I learned in uh, high school was German and they have the the little interesting S, right? Let me see if I can find my post. Um, da, da, da. I'll bring it up here really quick. Da, da, da. They have this interesting S character right here, right? I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it. And it's a it's like a double S, I think is what it is. Again, it's been a long time since I've been in high school, but I think this is like a double S. Like if you were to say Strausse, you might you might put that there. Someone in German correct me if I'm wrong. But the idea is not all languages just use the traditional um, you know, uh English alphabet, right? So here's Korean. I think uh this is Arabic, right? This is I think it's Tamil um an, an indian dialect right so uh there's all these different amazing characters that get used around the world obviously we can just give more numbers to it right to do that but we had to have some kind of way of introducing it so originally in ascii we just said oh well we're only using 127 characters later it was an extended version where they had 255 but they kind of said hey you know what we should um uh, we'll just store it all in a single byte, right? Uh, one byte is eight bits, and all that's uh, eight ones or zeros. And if they're all ones, that that could give you a number as high as two hundred fifty-five, right? Two, it's got two hundred fifty-six total values, zero to two fifty-five. Um, and so the ASCII table fit really fine in there, right? But people started coming along saying, hey, well, we've got all these Korean characters, Arabic characters, Chinese characters. Uh, we even have special characters, right, for other languages, right? Uh, like umlauts and things like that. What do we, how do we want to express those? And there were different encodings is what they call them, right? They said, okay, well, ASCII doesn't solve that problem. Maybe we can just have different encodings that like, um, uh, that represent all those other characters as well, right? And kind of what the what happened is through the years, the one that's kind of proven itself to be the most useful is UTF-8. And um, part of that is because it's backwards compatible, right? The first 127 characters of UTF-8 are the ASCII characters. And it's only when you get more, the, to those bigger characters that they start doing stuff. And I won't go into the details, but what the way you can think about it is instead of it being a single byte, uh, it can be represented by as many as four bytes. And the way they do that is you if you look at this table, you can kind of see what they're doing. If it's just a regular 
code point, like it's a regular ASCII, they just put the ASCII value in here, right? So the hex value is 24. And so you set these bits right here to, to equal 24. And then everyone knows it's 24. Once you start getting into multi-byte characters, you can set these, sorry, these first four bits to signify, hey, I'm a multi-byte character. So if you are a, if you need two bytes to be represented, for example, this um, pound sign right here, you put a one, one, and that says, hey, I've got my first byte coming up, but then I've got another byte coming later, right? So this is the second byte, and then this is the first byte of that value. And, uh, you, and they just keep doing that, right? So for three, it would look like this. They'll do three and then a zero, and then the corresponding bytes after it will have a one and zero. But the, I thought they did a really good job here of showing you where like these green bytes translate here. The way to think about it though is again, they've come up with an encoding that uh, some way of saying, hey computer, here's a bunch of ones and zeros, a bunch of ones and zeros, but when you display it on your screen or in your web browser or whatever, I want it to be represented, or I want that to represent this character, right? And that's what an encoding is. So why am I talking about all this stuff? Well, if you remember in the last video, uh, we had we were doing some leak code problems, and I just we had a string, and in Rust, the way that you iterate over a string is you say, "Hey, give me the characters in that string," and uh, um, you and I usually just collect them for uh, for efficiency or for simplicity. I guess is not efficient. It's definitely not efficient. It's for simplicity. And uh, what I do is I just gather up all those characters and uh, then I can, you know, process them one at a time through normal type iterators. Um, the reason I use the cares is because uh, just, you know, my at work brain says, oh, there might be UTF-8 values in there. And so I should be, I should make sure I'm accounting for those. But that's not always the case, right? Um, and... Uh, Rust does this though, and other languages do it, is by default their strings are UTF-8. That is, they're meant to be encoded in a special way so that you can have those special characters. Oh, I didn't even mention emojis, which is probably the most important part, right? Uh, with UTF-8, you can definitely include emojis, and it works just fine, right? There's all kinds of emojis that are part of the UTF-8 uh, encoding that allow you to, you know, send your special emojis to all your friends and everyone like that, right? So, um, anyway, uh, I want to, like, uh, talk, though, so what I want to do is kind of go over um, what it actually looks like, why they look different, and what's going on, and then we can kind of talk about how you can use that when you're solving puzzles why that's important and stuff like that. But let me just get back to the Rust thing really quick again, one more time. Go does this, other languages do this. C actually does do it, if you've ever used C or C++. It originally was only ASCII, and they added what's called a wide character, which is, means it's, it's a multi-byte character. And then it's your job to decode or encode it based on the encoding that you're using, right? Um, for Rust, they basically say, we're going to make all of our stuff UTF-8 by default. And that's just because, again, UTF-8 is largely the standard. You can do non-UTF things, UTF-8. For example, there's UTF-16, which gives you an even, which is set up differently in such a way, I think it's be it, it has to do with like how bytes are aligned and stuff, but um, it's a different type of encoding, or there's like Latin encoding, for example. Um, you may have opened a Word document and seen really weird characters because you didn't have like a Latin encoding installed on your system, things like that, right? These are all just ways, again, of the computer representing bits as characters on your screen or when you're doing processing, right? So again, Rust does it as UTF-8. If you want to do something else, if you need to do something else, you can look at OS string as another example, or you can treat it as bytes and do your own encoding and decoding that you need to right for that purpose but the default is utf-8 and if you're out in the real world doing real programming 
you should probably just assume things are UTF-8 and just do characters, right? Iterate over the characters, which we'll look at in a second. But, um, you know, for puzzles and stuff, or if you're going for super performance, you may be able to make an optimization where you say, oh, I know I'm only ever going to use ASCII. And so I'm just, I, I'm going to just use the bytes and we'll, we'll show you how to do that. Right. So, um, again, just at a really high level before we get into the code is ASCII is just like kind of the English alphabet is the way to think about it. It's what, it's what's on a traditional English keyboard. Um, UTF-8 expands that so that we can have all kinds of other languages. It talks about it right here, right? Um, all kinds of other languages, characters, um, uh, uh, emojis, right? All kinds of things, math symbols can be encoded with UTF-8. And it allows us to have a more rich, more meaningful conversation with more people and, and be more inclusive with respect to languages and uh, tools and, and stuff like that. So... Um, in the real world, again, I'll just say you probably want to be using UTF-8 or some kind of encoding that allows, uh, your, it allows it to be easily translated to other languages and, you know, used in, uh, different places. We didn't even talk about left to right and right to left, right? And those are things that, like, you can actually handle in UTF-8 if you need to. So, um, uh, given that, let's, let's go look at the code, um. So what do we got here? Uh, da, da, da. I wrote this little helper function to print some details about the strings so that we can look at it and see what it looks like. Um, I'm just gonna print the, str uh, the string itself and then I'm going to print its index and its byte index, like where is it in, what, what byte is it in and then the character itself, right? And so I'm gonna do that first for hello world and then this is, I just looked up Google Translate, uh, the Korean version of Hello World. I, I typed in Hello World. This is what it gave me in Korean. So I hope it's correct, and I'm not saying anything offensive or, or mean, right? But um, let's go ahead and run it and uh, look, at what it, look at what it spits out, okay? So here, uh, what do we have? For Hello World, again, it's all ASCII. So if we look at the index and byte index, they're all the same, right? You notice that they're all the same down here. And each of them only represent one byte. And this is how it traditionally worked, right? You get an H, that's a 72, and that's in the first position, right? Uh, a W in the seventh position is a 119. But let's go look at the Korean characters, right? So here's the Hello World version. You can see it's much smaller. Uh, again, there's only four characters, but there are, um, of the four characters, there are, each of them have three bytes. So in total, it is 12 bytes, right? And so you can see, even though their positions are 0, 1, 2, 3 for the characters, they are in byte position 0, 3, 6, 9, right? And these are the actual bytes that are used to represent. Notice they're high values. Again, that's because for a three byte character, the first three bits are going to be set to one to say, hey, there's something further down that, that there's more bytes that are coming. Uh, and that's so like the UTF-8 system can decode that and turn it into this character as opposed to these three bytes in ASCII, right? And that's what I want you to kind of think about as we're going through this code and, and we're looking at this, right? Is I'm printing out the bytes right here I'm printing out the byte index and the index and the character, right? The bytes and the character are not always the same, right? In ASCII, it definitely is, right? They're the same. But for UTF-8, it is not likely the case, right? If you're going to drop an emoji down here, it's going to look different. And maybe we just do that right now just so you can see. Um, <laughs> There's my hello world. And we'll do that, uh, and we'll run it again. Notice these ones are four byte characters now, right? So much different in that respect, but I'm getting emojis out and they're coming from UTF-8. So these are all bytes. If you were to try and print these out as their own bytes, you'd get weird ASCII characters, extended ASCII characters as well. And uh, it just wouldn't quite look right. 
Um, uh, and it wouldn't make sense, right? But the UTF encoding is smart enough to say, oh, this byte uh, says there's going to be four bytes. So I'm going to look for the next four bytes. I'm going to put these all together and that's going to make this wave hand emoji, okay? So I hope that makes sense of, uh, of what is different here. And um, I, I, I kept this up here because it, it might be helpful for you to look at, right? If you're interested in where is the character in the bytes, in the list of bytes, care indices is very useful, right? This is an iterator in Rust. And what it does is it goes through the string. Not only does it return the character as if you, right? Like if you just done car, cares, cars, it would, it would have been an iterator over each of the characters. Care indices or car indices returns also what position they're in, in what byte position they're in, right? So that's where you get the 369. So this is actually, it's interesting to look at, but it's often not helpful when you're solving puzzles. Um, why is that? Well, when they want to know, like, like for example, we're gonna look at like a min window or a max window in some of the code below. Um, we aren't interested in the byte position, we're interested in the character position, right? So um, we want to know like what is the minimum number of characters to fit in that window. And again, if it's ASCII, that is that's pro the character index and the byte index are okay, right? But when we're in uh, when we're in UTF-8 land, where we might be getting emojis or Korean or some other character, um, care indices will mostly just tell us where we at in the byte position, and this can be useful for certain text processing, right? But for puzzles, you're probably just interested in cares and enumerate, right? So that's what I'm doing right here. Enumerate meaning give me like the number of each of those. And that's where I get the zero, one, two, three, right? So you could write the leak code problem that we did yesterday or that we did a while back to solve this type of thing by just ensuring that you're always using cares and you're using enumerate, right? So if you use those two iterators, it would always work. And maybe if I have enough time in the video, we, we can actually try and do that. See if we can write some fun language, something that would that would do that for us, right? Um, but I just want to clarify, like, here's the difference between care indices will give you, like, the what byte position it's at, whereas enumerate will give you, like, what character is it in the, in the character list, right? So there's only four characters, but there's 12 bytes that you're going to be interested in looking at. Okay. Now, uh, there are some performance considerations that you should be thinking about, right? So, or not thinking about now that I think about it. For many cases, you just don't care about speed. And if that's the case, you can just use whatever you want. We talked though a few videos ago about um, some people that are very interested in solving advent to code with extreme speed, how fast they can go. In, if that's the case, you probably want to try and use bytes if you can use bytes. And why is that? Well, the um, UTF-8 is an encoding, right? So it has to do some math. It has to do some logic to figure out what bytes do I want to collect and how do I want to present them and send them back to the user. And that can that can take some time. And... Um, depending on how um, performant you need to be, that could be non-trivial time, okay? So I actually, I just pulled this random file um, from my thing that I looked for a, a, a file that's relatively large. I think this is like half a meg or something like that. Some relatively large file that was gonna be, take some time to process. And I just ran this little program or this little for loop. Basically, I'm looking for vowels in in this file but uh, if you look at the, the difference between up here and down here is one is using the cars and one is using the bytes okay and let's look at the processing time for these two right there, again there's not much different is one is using cars one is using bytes to iterate over it and look for vowels notice the time difference though that when we're using cars it takes 23 milliseconds versus when we're using bytes it takes eight it is substantially faster to work on bytes 
than it is on cars. And why is that? Again, because of the UTF-8 encoding. The bytes can look a little unreadable though, right? If you look here, this is the cars example, right? When we're doing the cars. Notice I can just say, oh, here's an A, E, I, O, and U, and see if, uh, you know, this array, excuse me, contains this character, the character that I'm iterating over. Um, it looks a little weird down here because we have to add these Bs to the beginning of it. And basically that's just telling Rust, the compiler, hey, when you compile this, it's not a character, it's actually a byte, treated as a byte, right? And so you could also use uh, as U8. Uh, that's not generally encouraged though because you can just add this B to the front of it that tells Rust, oh, it's a byte, treated as a byte, not as a character. Um, uh, so it loses a little bit in readability, not a ton though. And depending what you're doing, you may not even notice something like this. Um, but again, it's much, much faster. So if you're going for speed and you know, you're only using ASCII, you're only using those bytes, doing something like this is probably okay. Right. Uh, it might be okay to just use bytes too. If you're just doing comparisons, right. If you're doing some interesting comparisons, um, the problem you run into is just character boundaries and stuff like that. So whenever you're working on like characters and you know there's going to be non-ASCII characters using a cars iterator will work, will, will probably do best, right? But for the puzzle we, um, the puzzle we did uh, last time, I thought, what what if we just tried to speed this up a little bit? And I didn't do a performance analysis, but we know that bytes are faster. And we know we're only getting ASCII. Um, so what if we just tried to speed this up? What would that look like? Um, I don't have, maybe I can bring, uh, I'll bring it up really quick just so we can look at it. My original implementation looks like this right here. So notice again, I collected up all the characters into this little cars um, uh vec vector this array right here that i could reuse uh, all over the place you can see here's a, excuse me here's where i enumerate over it here's where i like uh get the actual left value from it because i have that array right there this is not super performant again especially for large strings because you have to basically go through the whole thing turn it into an array and then you can use it for indexing and stuff down here there is a faster way, and uh, part of it, it, part of the reason why it works is because uh, iterators uh, just give you pointers or references to the data in the the data in the original object, right? So in this case, it's strings. So it's going to give us characters or bytes, and we can actually have multiple iterators at once. So that's how we change this solution: is uh, instead of creating a, a, a vector of all of our characters, we're just going to have a left iter and we're going to track our left and left character based on that iterator. Notice I'm using bytes and enumerate um, uh, for, you know, quote unquote speed. If we knew we were using UTF-8, we could actually change this, right? And maybe we'll do that in a minute just so we can run an example with some interesting stuff, right? Uh, interesting things, right? Uh, okay, but let's just look at what's happening here. We now have two iterators. We have that left iterator that's iterating and enumerating over the bytes, but we also have a right one that's iterating and enumerating over the bytes here, right? And the way to think about this is really just, uh, maybe I can bring up a little, the little jam board. We were look we we were looking at this the other day if you remember where's the character one, uh, here's one like this, uh, you can think about as a as a as opposed to having like pointers left and right, we're going to have iterators and they're just going to here's the left iterator and here's the right iterator they're both going to iterate over the same string but they're just going to be in different positions in their iteration, right so again they're both referencing the same original string. But if you say, hey, what's the next one for left? It will say, oh, it's this one right here. And if you say, what's the next one for right? It will say, oh, it's this one over here, right? 
So again, we have two iterators that are just referencing the same string. And we can just loop through that. We can just do those loops, right? So how does the logic change? Well, the right actually doesn't change much. We just say, hey, what are the next, what's the next byte and its position? Uh, it's down here when we're doing this logic. Remember, we are uh, we knew that we could, we knew we'd found like a minimum window if we found all the values in T. And so if that's the case, we can start trying to shrink the window, right? And so here's where we update our state where we say, oh, if we found a new smaller window, then we have a new minimum window. Um, and then we want to move our left position, right? Uh, so our left is right here. We want to move it here to bring it closer. I think I'm doing that the wrong way because you're on the other side. But um, the idea is um, if if the left character is in our map, we want to uh, get rid of it, which is increment it. And then we want in our original code, um, did I already get rid of that? Boo. Oh, maybe I had it somewhere else. Um, in our original code, we just said left plus plus essentially is what we did. Left plus equals one. We can't do that anymore because we have an iterator, but we can still call iter next, right? Uh, so we have our left iterator and we just call next and we update our left and our left character. We just have to do some additional checking. If we happen to hit the end of the string, obviously we can't go that far. Iter next will return none. So we just, if that's the case, we, we know we're done and we can break, right? But um, I can run the unit tests and you can see they run just fine if we're, um, uh, and it, it, we're running the same tests, right? So it still works, but now we're using bytes instead of characters and uh, it, it should be running more faster, right? It should be running faster. We're using two iterators now instead of, you know, a collection, collecting it, and then just, you know, having the left be an index into that collection. So um, I, do, I don't think I did it this way, mostly because it was just easier to show the algorithm if you treated it as an array. But of course, you if you have, you know, iterators, you can you can iterate over both sides of the sliding window to solve that problem, right? Um, so again, this is using bytes. What might it look like if we were using uh, characters? Let's just take this right now and we'll give it a try. See if we can um, do it ourselves. Uh, let's call it, we can get rid of this stuff and let's call it min window substring cars. And uh, we'll just do this because we know we'll be, we, we'll be getting some strange characters that, um, might not like quite look right. In fact, maybe we'll use emojis, right? So we can still do the same thing here, except we want don't want to do bytes. We want to change this to uh, cars. And I guess we can uh, change this B to a C because now we're doing characters, right? So we'll change this to a C, these two to a C. Um, and now we're not enumerating over or iterating over bytes anymore. We're doing cares, cars again, uh, counts, da, 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 da. cars, count C. Oh, I use a U8 up here. It's now a car. Again, a byte is a U8, right? It's an actual like integer value. Here we're going to treat it as a car, but I think that's all we actually have to change, right? Just whenever we use bytes, we now use cars and the logic of the code doesn't change, but now we could potentially solve the problem, right? So we can, what may we just copy this, um, uh, test case right here and, um, We'll create one for uh, cars. We'll test the cars and oh, sorry, I'm using a different 
editor. We'll just do this first one though, just to make sure it actually still does the original solution. None of this stuff else change, but we'll run it. Sure enough, it passes. Okay, so let's go find some emojis and uh, see if we can't come up with two strings that we can test. Actually, let's see if uh, good old Mr. ChatGPT can help us. Uh, I want to do like some other emojis. That's not really helpful, huh? It's not really helping us. Okay, uh, let's go look up emojis. Uh, am I going to regret clicking on one of these things? We'll just select a whole bunch of them. Actually, let's select like these and put them in here. And we'll say we want like... Um, we want the minimum window that has like this smiling face and this thing right here. So we'll move this around. Put this here, put this here, and then maybe put this guy right here. So the idea is this guy, we want this guy and this guy to both be in the string and the minimum window should be two, but it should find this four first, right? So uh, if we say let, hey, look, it found it for us already. Uh, uh, uh. And it should find that last two right here instead of this one, right? Uh. So we run our test. It did not pass. Why did it not pass? Uh oh, did I do something wrong? Ooh, I can't do it this way. So notice I'm doing like a slice of the string. That's not going to work. This would be a case where we'd probably want to, where we could use care indices to get the substring, but we can probably just track the min left, min right. So if we just go here and we say, uh, let uh, mute min left, we'll start there and then we'll say, that uh, so these that we need to change are um, min right minus min left plus one and then this one is min left equals zero and min right equals zero. This is probably not, I'm doing this live, I apologize. There's probably a better way to do this, but now we can do, uh, there we go skip and then take and collect that should do it there you go yep that does it okay so what what did we have to change here we actually had to do some additional work to to work with the emojis but we created this emoji one right and now it does work with characters right so we can do a bunch of emojis we can say hey find them in window and it should bring back this which is right here right it won't return this string right here because that has four this one only has two um and it works but we had to make some actual changes right um i thought we could just change uh, bytes to characters but that didn't work because we were indexing into it right so we were indexing positions 
which are in the middle of a byte count, and that's why we were getting this failure. Um, so again, where it, it, this is where there's a difference in UTF-8 versus what byte are we on versus what character are we on. Uh, and it actually tells you byte six is not in a care boundary, right? It found the position, right? It knew that it was zero, one, two, three, four. Oh, you can't see this part. It knew that it was zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It started at six, or sorry, six right here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here and here, I don't remember exactly. But basically what it's saying is, hey, oh no, it wasn't. It, it, it's when it was right here, when it was moving it, right? It was shortening it and, it. and it failed because it was like, hey, six is not within a, a character boundary. It's the middle of a character, right? These are all four bytes and six is in the middle of the world emoji. But what we actually wanted was the sixth character, not the sixth byte. Did I say that wrong? I'll, I'll say it one more time. Our algorithm was finding, knew that it was the sixth character. But when we were doing this uh, slice here from left to right, it was finding, it, it thought it was at, it thought it should go from position six to like position eight, for example. Uh, character eight to character, it was going, I think it was doing six to eight right here, these right here. But character six is different from byte six, right? Byte six is in the, in the middle of this world emoji. And that's what this error is telling us in Rust. It says, this world emoji constitutes bytes four through eight. You asked for byte six, that doesn't make any sense within this, within this string right here. So we had to do some additional math. We can probably clean it up, right? So um, again, we're checking this and this. And so um, I mean, we could probably just check the right side or something like that. But the logic doesn't change that much, right? We just say, oh, there's a left and a right. And we want to like move the left and the right, or we want to update the min left and min right if we ever find a smaller one, right? Um, and then at the end, once we've done that, we can iterate through the characters, skip the first left characters, and then take however many we found, right? Which is min right minus min left plus one, and we can collect that, right? And so that will give us, this is just some math of saying, essentially think about this as like, I don't know if you've done SQL before, right? You have a skip and a limit. We're gonna do a skip and a limit through our character in the C, and that's gonna give us the interesting characters for our leak code problem to help us finally pass the test, right? It worked the second time through. So all of this was to say, there is a difference between bytes and characters, right? Um, especially in modern programming languages. Most modern programming languages are using UTF-8, at least the ones that I'm familiar with. Um, uh, they And a lot of uh, older languages have tried to become backwards compatible, right? I think I mentioned C, has special structs now that are wide characters that are used to represent these additional things. And uh, I don't remember a lot about it, so I can't answer a lot of questions. Uh, but there, uh, other languages are doing that, right? The goal is to try and, uh, it, because the rest of the world <laughs> needs to use this language, right? I'm sure many of you listening right now are not sitting in front, you know, sitting in, Canada or America with a keyboard like this, you've got your own keyboard that has special characters. And uh, Rust wants to make sure they're accommodating for those characters. When you're solving real world problems, you want to accommodate for those characters. And that means using UTF-8. So it may mean that you're doing some additional stuff to get that to work, right? We, we had to switch to cars. We had to track our mins and maxes differently for our algorithm, but it then made our program work for both cases. Now, I will say again, one last time, many of the problems, at least the ones that you'll see on this channel, just assume ASCII. That's not always the case. Sometimes the problems are specifically geared towards helping you understand the difference between ASCII and UTF-8 or some other encoding. Um, but, a lot of times you can't assume ASCII. And if you want to do that, feel free to just use bytes. It will improve your performance. Um, 
it might not always look as clean. This one actually looks pretty nice, mostly because we aren't doing anything special with this solution, right? But we are, you know, if you're here and you're doing some kind of like validation or data checking, it will look a little bit different, right? Okay, I hope you guys uh, or you all had fun uh, going through this little whirlwind of ASCII, these little characters right here versus UTF-8. Uh, this more complex system, but gives you a much richer, richer uh, set of characters to work with. Um, again, just uh, be mindful of what you're doing and how you're doing it, and then pick the right thing that you need to do to solve your problem, right? If you're going for performance and you know you can, maybe just use ASCII, use the bytes in Rust, and that will that will go fast. Otherwise, there's no problem with using a string and uh, just iterating over the characters um, to getting those values, right? Um, and uh, feel free to read about UTF-8 more. I found it really interesting. You see it works in my terminal. It doesn't work in all, it doesn't always work in terminals, I guess I should say. Um, what was, uh, I'll run it again so you can just see it. Uh, I mean, I guess it, depending on what, where you're coming from, your terminal may just work. Uh, I use arch by the way. <laughs> um, and so uh, I say that in jest that by default, these characters aren't available and you have to kind of like do some magic to say, Hey, uh, use, you have to just make sure you're using a font that understands what those characters are. Right. Uh, but I think it makes, uh, you know, the world a better place that we can use all these characters and um, it, it brings the language to more people. So I think what Rust has done is cool. And I think the UTF-8 system is cool. There's other encodings. Again, I, I did like one week in UTF-16 and I've forgotten most of it. So I couldn't tell you what it was about. Uh, but there's other encodings, like I said, Latin encoding. Uh, these are just things to think about. The world has mostly moved to UTF-8, so if you are doing programming, you will likely be interested in UTF-8, and your language may or may not support it, and you may have to decide, how am I going to deal with this, right? If my if the language I'm using doesn't support UTF-8, but I want to make it available to another country, that there will be a struggle there, right? And you'll just have to, There's there's ways to figure that out. Many Light, there's libraries that people have written to kind of help with these things and stuff to do. Uh, but there you go. I hope you've enjoyed this little thing. Um, I, the, the next videos I have uh, are some more puzzle solving, so we'll get back to that. Um, but um, I did think this was kind of an interesting interlude. I felt like I learned a lot just uh, kind of thinking about these things, especially from like a performance perspective. Right, so it might be interesting to go back to some of the problems we've solved before, and see if uh, you know from a performance perspective, can we get them super fast by just uh, iterating over bytes instead of characters? Um, that's something to think about. So, there you go. I think I've said all right. That's it, as many times as I should in one video. Uh, so I will just wave and say goodbye, everybody. Hope you have an amazing day, evening, morning, night, wherever you may be, and we'll talk to you next time.